When I tell people I'm a missionary, I get all kinds of questions. People ask, what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. Or a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 million lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, it's a thing. But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked it, where is the finish line? That's the question I want to hear. What does mission accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us. You can pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutiae of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what our finish line looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finish line. <laughs> God speak, you give, we go. Everything starts with your gift, so the any I'm strong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where, together, we make Jesus known. Well, together we do want to make Jesus known, and we're thankful for those who do that both locally and globally, and we pray for all of our missionaries that are serving the interest of Southern Baptists, but also, uh, most importantly, for the kingdom of God all around the world today. We're thankful to have Dr. Travis Figures with us, as well as his family. He is a pastor of First Baptist Church, Richmond, Kentucky. He's an alumnus of our institution. And uh, today we do have the privilege of extending to him an award that uh, he was uh, given during the Alumni Association back in late July, 1st of, uh, 1st of August. This award is voted on by our uh, faculty members here at Clear Creek. It's the Delta Epsilon Chi Alumni Award. And it's for an alumnus who has uh, exhibited outstanding intellectual achievement, Christ-like character and leadership ability, providing at least 10 years uh, have elapsed since graduation. That is an honorary award. And so if you would, Travis, come. Dr. Goodman's going to present you with that. Let's give him a hand this morning. thankful for their ministry to First Baptist Church in Richmond, for their love for Clear Creek and their partnership uh, in the ministry through the cooperative program and uh, just uh, encouraged to hear him today as he preaches for us from the word of God. Unspoken request today, show of hands, amen. Let's pray together. We'll worship King Jesus. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for this day that you have made the beauty of the creation, Father, that surrounds us today. We see your fingerprints all over the evidence of what we call general revelation. And Father, we pray for this chapel service today. I pray today that uh, those with hurting hearts would be healed, that those with troubled spirits would be encouraged. Father, we pray, God, that you would uh, deliver those that are in the bondage of sin today, set them free through the power of the preaching of your word. We pray for your servant who will come and stand behind the sacred desk. Father, may you strengthen him for the task that is before him. Loose his tongue, help him to preach in an unction of your Holy Spirit today. And Lord, we pray that you'd be honored and glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Clear Creek. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand and worship our Savior.
Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my us to love you more, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. I'm glad to uh, be with you today. I am so encouraged uh, in this little trip to Clear Creek because, um, man, it's like breathed new life into me. And so, uh, doctor, I am uh, thankful for your vision, and I'm thankful for what the Lord is doing here at Clear Creek. Man, I just I feel alive this morning because of that, and I'm grateful for you as students, and I want to tell you that uh, the Lord has done a, a great favor to you by leading you um, here to Clear Creek because um, you're going to get such a firm foundation for the rest of your calling and the rest of your ministry. And I will tell you that um, because of Clear Creek, I was able to go to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, was able to test out of a quarter of a master's degree uh, because they know all about the, the depth of Clear Creek. And it did not cost me for that quarter either. So that's, that's a big plus. So Clear Creek's actually putting money in your pockets if uh, the Lord leads you to go seminary. And I'm sure maybe some of our other Southern Baptist seminaries may have something along the same line. Uh, today, I want to tell you it's a little different preaching in chapel than it is preaching anywhere else. Because I don't know if other preachers feel this way or not, but I'm thinking, okay, Lord, what is it that I need to share do I need to share a message of encouragement uh, to those who are entering the ministry? Is it something that struggles are there? I can remember financial strains when, uh, when, when my family was here. Uh, in fact, we had, um, we had two boys born in the length of time 
uh, that I was here, and um, I, I know that that can, that can really be a, a big deal too. Everybody comes to Clear Creek single, but they leave married anymore. And uh, not only do you leave with a wife and maybe a car full of kids, but you leave with about 50 extra pounds. Can I get a witness? Yeah, I'm still trying to get rid of a little bit of Clear Creek from when I was here. So I said, Lord, is it, is it that they need some encouragement this morning? Is that what we need to preach? Or is it something different? And I really feel like what God led me to preach and to share with you is something different. It, I hope it is some encouragement to you. But I want to I raise the bar a little bit, okay? Um, I want to issue a challenge to you because I do feel like one of the things that we have failed in in the church in America in this day is we set the bar too low for the church. And so many times we are preaching sermons that are so shallow that we're a mile wide but only an inch deep. And because of that, we have very shallow Christians. And when you have shallow Christians, you have shallow Christianity. And that's a lot of what we're seeing today in our nation. And so I just want to give you a challenge that when you're preaching, if you're pastoring, if you're doing ministry, raise the bar a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that I'm saying this from experience. Um, last year in the month of August, um, I took the month of August and I preached a series of messages that I called Ologies in August. And we literally went through some systematic theology. We went through the Ologies of the Bible. And in doing that, I wasn't sure what would happen. I didn't know if our attendance would begin to decrease. I didn't know if uh, support would me begin to decrease, if they'd say, Pastor, uh, if we wanted that, we would have went to seminary. I didn't know what they would say. But I want to tell you this. Our, uh, our attendance increased. People were asking for more at the end of it because I really think that our folks can handle it. I really think God's people can handle it. And if, he is, if we would raise the bar and he would begin to work through that, the Lord would work, would work through that, how amazing it would be to see our churches strengthen if they would have a foundation of faith that was a little bit deeper. And so this morning, I want to ask you to take your Bible and find the book of Exodus. And as you find the book of Exodus, I'm going to share with you this morning the ID of I am. We're going to be ask, uh, trying to answer the question of who is God? Who is God? Now, I know that human language cannot truly fathom or explain uh, to really answer that question, but the reality is we need to know that, and especially leading in ministry, we need to be able to say that. As believers, we need to be able to say that. And our Christian walk needs to become something more then a compartmentalized opportunity on Sunday morning, and if you're real holy, on Wednesday nights. It needs to be something that permeates our life. And so I want to challenge you for that. And I really believe that if we could get the church to truly meet God and know who he is, to know the depth of who he is, that just maybe it would cause them to fall in love with him so much deeper that we would see the church in America become so much stronger. And so in Exodus chapter 3... I'm going to begin reading um, the first six verses, and then we're going to drop down to verse 13. You're going to know the narrative. I'm going to use this as a foundation. Um, I thought, man, I'll just go and I'll take a, a text. We'll do an expository sermon. We'll exegete it and we'll dissect it. But because this is chapel, we're going to do it a little differently, okay? We're going to use this as a foundation, but then we're going to take all of the Bible and we're just going to begin to learn together this morning who is God. Because we know this. We know that the Bible not only tells us history, it tells us his story. And so when we're looking through Scripture, we can actually look at the text on the page and get some good, firm doctrine, but it's in kind of that understanding of how God's interacting with people that we sometimes learn even deeper understandings about his attributes. And so let's stand. Let's give God reverence for the reading of his word. And look there in verse 1. Now Moses was pastoring the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. 
And he said, here I, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from, uh, from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Drop down to verse 13, if you would, and I just want to read 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God, we praise you this morning because you are the I am. And Lord, as we have an opportunity to just together learn more about who you are, would you open our understanding? God, if there's something that is said or done that brings you glory, God, we want to rejoice in that. But God, show us who you are. We say, as Moses said, we beseech you, show us your glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. And if you affirm that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. All right, you may be seated. I really believe this. I believe that, that our churches can handle the raising of the bar. I think that you can even use more technical language and you can use theological language as long as you're leading them uh, to get there slowly, as long as you're leading them there and to explain it. Because we know if you speak over someone's head, no matter how great your vocabulary is, if they don't understand it and they're the hearer and they don't receive the message, then you failed. And so we have to make sure that we're bridging the gap with folks as we're doing that. But I believe that, that they can handle it. I believe that they can cognizantly re, re, realize and understand who God is and all about the text of Scripture. But let's be honest. You're sitting in class. How many people's already had systematic theology here? Anybody? So get ready, get ready. This is going to open your understanding, okay? Because you're going to begin to take the Bible and look at it as a system, understanding these different aspects and pulling all of the text together to walk away with a clear understanding of what the Scripture says about any particular subject within the Bible. And so in this case, we're talking about theology, the study and the understanding, the logos of God, the word of who he is. And so when we're opening the text of the book of Exodus, we see that Moses is being called by the Lord thou, there at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, and he's having a discussion with him. A miraculous thing has happened. That he sees a bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. And because of that, that gets Moses' attention. And in that, God begins to have a conversation. The neat thing about the book of Exodus is that uh, it, after it's succeeding the book of Genesis, Genesis tells us a lot about creation and that God did these things, but really it's in the book of Exodus that we're introduced to who God is. Between Genesis 1 and Genesis 12, you've covered 2,000 years of human history. By the time you finish Genesis chapter 50, you've covered another 500 years of human history. If the Exodus is dated around 1446 or somewhere around 1500 B.C., we're talking 2,500 years of human history has happened by the time that we're opening up and looking at the life of Moses. And so we've had all of this time that Moses has written about in the book of Genesis that we've not really been introduced to God. We've seen God's actions we know that God has dealt with Abraham, he's dealt with uh, Jacob, he's dealt with Isaac, he's dealt with people, but it's in Exodus chapter 3 that Moses has an interaction with God where God introduces himself. You know, um, someone may, may call me Travis, and I may introduce myself as Travis, but Jess, my wife, she knows me as Trav. That's what she calls me, Trav. And so she knows me in an intimate understanding. When God introduces himself to Moses, he introduces himself in the most intimate way. <clears throat> he gives us the, the greatest name that God would have in Scripture. We understand today that this is how we get our, our English of Jehovah from the word Yahweh, 
made up four Hebrew letters, and then we've put the, uh, the, uh, the vowels in there so that we're able to pronounce it a little better, and we can pronounce it Yahweh. And we know that in some places it's Jehovah, and we pronounce it for us with a J, Jehovah. This is that name throughout Scripture that we have that God is introducing himself, I am that I am. Literally, the word Yahweh means to exist. He is ever existing from eternity past to eternity present and future. God has always existed. And the thing about answering this question of who is God, as you're getting a theological education, if you weren't required to write a certain number of pages, you just wrote until you got finished, how would you introduce God? How would you define who God is? What would you be able to say? Well, this is something that we know. We know that God has revealed himself to us in two ways. In fact, our brother prayed this just a little bit ago. The first one is in general revelation. In general revelation, I'm going to call this the world, the world that's around us. And with the world around us, we have nature and history and our conscience. Those are the things that God has given us to know about general revelation. In fact, just a little snippet to show you what I'm talking about. In Job chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. In fact, I'm going to step to the side and read it with you. But now ask the beast and let them teach you. And the birds of the heavens and let them tell you. Or speak to the earth and let it teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare it to you. Next slide. But who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. In whose hand is the life of every living thing. And the breath of all mankind. Now, if we're going back to study that text, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look and see Job's struggles and how Job's friends probably weren't real good friends at all, and they're kind of accusing Job of all of that. But in reality, in studying that, when you read between the lines, we're actually giving some understanding of who God is. Job's friends coming and talking, understanding the writing of the book of Job, inspired by the Holy Spirit, think of what we're told. Go ask the beast of the world. Go ask creation. Go ask the animals. Who is God? In other words, all of creation knows who God is, except many times humanity, and we're trying to prove that he doesn't exist. But in that, it tells us that creation knows who he is. And so through creation, God has revealed himself to us. According to the book of Romans 1, that's enough to condemn us, that we know that God has existence. But God so loves us that he has given us not only the world around us, but the word before us. We have the word of God to teach us special revelation. And so in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says these words, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. It tells us deeper things about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an understanding of who he is, his purpose, the divine plan of salvation. All the things that God wanted us to know about him is given to us in the pages of the word of God. And so with that, we understand from Moses's interaction through general revelation and special revelation that God wants us to know who he is. He not only wants us to know facts about him, he wants us to have an intimate personal knowledge of who he is, but I do want you to know this morning that there are some factual things that we need to know about God because it will shape your view of everything that you study while you're here at Clear Creek. It will shape your view of everything that you teach or preach or live out for the rest of your life. And so I want to challenge you when you're in ministry to give these kinds of things to the people that you're ministering to and raise the bar. So here it is, five, man, we're row. Five IDs of the I am. Number one, God is self-existent and self-sufficient. Now, um, we're on Eastern time here. I came from Eastern time. They act like they're on Central time, like they're still asleep. So I'm going to get you to read it with me, all right? I'm going to say ID number one, and you read it with me. ID number one, God is What in the world does that mean? Look here, Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
And so within that text of Scripture, we're given some insight into who God is. You and I are here because we were born. Um, I was born January the 1st, 1982. I'm 42 years old as of this past January. And I know that I had a beginning, and I know that, that there's going to come a time that there's going to be an ending of my physical life on earth. But that's not true of God. We know that God is self-existent and self-sufficient. He is eternal. One of the things that we know is that the Greeks had a hard time comprehending creationism. And so they thought that the universe was ever existing. And one of the things that they pictured is, is to explain was that the world was being held on the shoulders of Atlas. And that's how the world was being able to be in existence, being held up, and that it had no beginning and no end. But we know that that's not true. We know that God created. And for him to create, he's outside the system. And if he's outside the system, he is actually eternal, self-existent and self-sufficient. He didn't need to be born. He didn't have anyone to create him. He is self-existent. And so within that, he's also self-sufficient. Right now, you cannot say heart keep beating and have any control over that. You can't say to your lungs, keep breathing, and you're going to make them do that. Now, you can, in fact, say, I'm going to exercise sovereignty in my life, and I'm going to stop breathing, and you can hold your breath. Little kids do this sometimes when they get mad. Going to show mom and dad a lesson. I'm just going to hold my breath, and they'll hold it, and you know what? They'll hold it till they pass out, and then they'll start breathing. Because God has created our bodies in a way to know. And he is the one that keeps us alive. In fact, the Bible tells us that it's in him that we live and move and have our existence. We have brain waves and, and breaths and heartbeats and brain waves. All of these things because of the fact that God is consciously causing that to happen. Every single day that we have a fresh sunrise from our perspective or a sunset, everything that is happening, God is allowing or causing one or the other to happen. He is self-existent and self-sufficient. We are not. So that's why when Jesus was teaching the model prayer, he opened with our Father who is in heaven because we're on earth. It's a recognition of who he is. So when we're explaining who God is, we need to realize he is transcendently above us. So all of a sudden, we shouldn't take God's name in vain because we've realized God's name has strength and power because he is self-existent and self-sufficient. Number two, he is, God is immaterial and immutable. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it tells us God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Um, while I was here, one of the classes that I took was philosophy required uh, by the major. Has anyone had philosophy yet? Oh, man, wasn't that fantastic? And, um, and, and I had Dr. Hughes, bless the Lord. Uh, he's, he's with the Lord now, such a, such a great testimony for Dr. Hughes. And I can remember him, there was a, a desk in there, and he said, is this a desk or does it have desk-like properties? And it's like, um, What? And, and so, so it's deep, isn't it? That's kind of what we're talking about, the immaterial. We're fighting a war. The war is invisible. And the war is actually immaterial. And that's why the Apostle Paul would say that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in heavenly or high places. And that's why our weapons are not carnal but spiritual pulling down strongholds. And so in understanding that, we understand that there's a spiritual realm. And so scripture, when Jesus is meeting with the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, he's having a conversation. He's going to introduce her to water, not only water that will cause her to thirst again, but water that will quench her thirst forever, living water. He's talking about salvation, but in the midst of that, he gives us a snippet about who God is. God is a spirit, 
And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so uh, in systematic theology, you're going to learn this. You have to decide which way you're going to lean. There's two different schools of thought. There's either a dichotomy of man or there's going to be a trichotomy of man. Now, I'm not sure what you'll be taught and that professor will lean towards. I'm not sure what you'll walk away with. But I know for me, when I walked away, I believed in the trichotomy of man, that man is body, soul, and spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul says, I pray that your whole body and soul and spirit will remain unto the coming of the Lord. And so with that, we understand with the body, we have this physical life, and we understand physical life below us. We have firm foundation that we're standing on. With our soul, the Greek word is suke. It's how we get our, our English word psyche or psychological. We have conscious life and we know the world around us. Then with the spirit, we have spiritual life and we know the world that is above us. And so those three aspects is, is coming into play in understanding who God is because we know that God is immaterial. He is spirit. And if we're going to worship him, there's an immaterial part of us that's going to worship him. In fact, the book of Romans, Paul would say that our spirit is bearing witness with his spirit. That's how we have communion with one another. Luke chapter 24, verse 39, though, is this a contradiction? Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus is both God and man. But he says here, Jesus said, see my hands and my feet. That's not immaterial. See my hands and my feet, that's physical. That is uh, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for I am not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So is that a contradiction? No. What it does is it gives us an even deeper understanding of who God is. Because God is spirit, but Jesus is the God-man. And he's put on flesh. And as he's put on flesh, he says, look, I'm alive. I'm human like you are, but he's 100% God. That understanding that he is immaterial is so important. Because who Jesus is gives us a deeper understanding in the physical of who who God is in the spiritual. Why? Colossians 1.15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is very God, except for the fact that we understand something amazing about him is that he also has uh, the same temptations that we've had. He can, he can align with us in life on earth because he has put on flesh and he has put on blood. We also know that he is immutable. God doesn't change. And so when we see his interactions with his people, we know that we can understand how he desires to interact with us. So in the book of uh, Malachi in the Old Testament, Malachi the prophet is writing, thus says the Lord, and he says, I, the Lord God, do not change. Then in the New Testament, to reaffirm that truth, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is immutable. He does not change change. And so we now know a little something different about God that he doesn't change. We may change. When I was here, I didn't have all of this gray right here. But I'm changing. I'm changing. Clear Creek might have put a little bit of that there, to be honest with you. But now I'm changing. God never changes. Number three, God is triune and omni. He is triune and he is omni. I want you to listen to this. You know this. I'm not really probably introducing anything new to you, but when you pull it all together, it gives us a snapshot of God. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, a plural pronoun, make man in our, another plural pronoun, image, according to our likeness. And let them, that's mankind, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God is speaking in a business meeting with himself, and he's saying, let us, plural, make man, create man in our, plural, own image. It's interesting that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when the Jewish people quote the Shema, 
they have it memorized. They have it on their prayer shawl, on their tallit, and they have it in their heart. They pray and they say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But the word for God in the Hebrew is Elohim. And you'll learn that in Hebrew, anything with the im on the end of it, the I am, is plural. El is singular, but Elohim is plural. And so literally, if we wanted to translate it so that it would make sense by Hebrew standards, it really should be the Lord our God's is one. But we don't have multiple gods, do we? It's introducing a theological understanding of the Trinity of God. The Lord our God is one. And we know that he's manifested in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's all kinds of illustrations to try to give you some, some understanding. But listen, there truly is nothing exactly like God. So an egg or water or whatever someone's going to try to show you, that's not going to really cope and, and give us the understanding of the Trinity because there is nothing like him except for the best understanding that we would have is God's creation. Because God is triune and he creates in a triune understanding, okay? Let me show you what I mean. We understand existence in this way, a trinity. Time, space, matter. Then with time, we understand time in a trinity. Past, present, and future. We even understand space and matter in that way, height, and width and depth. Now, none of those are exactly like God, but they can help us understand how something singular can be understood plurally, how that there can be multiple facets of this kind of understanding. So it's here that I want to stop for a minute and make sure that we understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? So I want you to see this on, on the screen, and I want you to see kind of as we're talking about this as a study. So first of all, we have the Father, then we have the Son, and then we have the Spirit. When we're talking about fields of study with the Father, I'm going to say that this is the overall understanding of God, and we're going to call that theology, the study of who God is. With the Son, there's a different terminology. We call this Christology. And, and I'll, I want to talk about this afterwards. Dr. Lucas, I want us to have a conversation. It's not called Jesusology. And there's a reason for it. Can I just present that as a question to you all? Why it's not called Jesusology and it's called Christology? And then you all talk about it, okay? And that'll be a great discussion on campus at Clear Creek. But it's Christology. And then with the Holy Spirit, there's that Greek word that comes in for spirit, pneuma. And it's pneumatology. And so this is what we have as fields of study of the Trinity. It's all talking about God, but these are different facets, Okay. Then underneath the Father, I want you to understand that there's a different understanding for who he is and what his ministry is and how he has revealed himself to us, okay? So with the Father, he is not seen or felt. Now, I want to use that very strictly because I know someone is going to say this. Well, wait a minute. He's not seen or felt, but he's heard. And that's true. But he's not seen. God says, no man has seen me. If he did, he would die. Well, what about Moses? Moses was in the cleft of the rock, and he saw the hind parts of God. No, that was a manifestation of God. If Moses had truly seen God, he would have not been able to live. So I just want to make sure that you know that's not a, a heresy or a contradiction, okay? With Christology, with Christ, he has seen and felt. That's what he was saying in the book of Luke. Come, feel me. I'm not a spirit. You can handle me. He has seen and he has felt. And then the Holy Spirit, so amazing. You know his existence, but you can't prove that really, can you? but you know in your heart because he has felt, but he's not seen. This is how Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to Nicodemus. He said it's like the wind, pneuma. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, but you can feel its effects. So is those who are born of the kingdom of God. That's why you must be born again. For that which is born of the, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he's introducing the Holy Spirit. We can't tell where he's at or what he's doing, but we know his presence when it's there. It's felt, but it is not seen, okay? We see that picture in Jesus' baptism. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized and the Father is speaking. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We have the Spirit coming down as if a dove uh, lighting upon Jesus, who is the Son of God, the Son of Man in the flesh, who is in the water. So we have a picture of the Trinity. 
That is really kind of an over-understanding of the theology. But what about Christology? I introduced this word to our folks at First Baptist Richmond, and I want to tell you what they did. They didn't say, oh, man, I wish he would hush and quit talking about this. They said, well, wait a minute, I want to see how that's spelled. They wanted to know. And I'm telling you, people want to know this stuff because they want to know God better. And that word is hypostatic union. Have you learned about hypostatic union yet? Doesn't that bless your heart that you know that? Man, don't you feel smarter that you can say hypostatic union and you're not talking about hydraulics on a lawnmower, you're talking about Jesus. What is the hypostatic union of Christ? It's that he is God and man. 100% God and 100% man. Don't get it wrong in mathematics because you might want to say 50% and 50% equals 100%, but Jesus, he defies mathematics, doesn't he? It's 100% God and 100% man. And in that understanding, we realize that Jesus is one person who has two natures. That is important for you to know because a lot of heresy has come from the fact of who Jesus is in their Christological thinking. So in John 1, 14, we're told the Word was made flesh. We beheld Him. We saw Him. We, we know that He existed. But in Philippians chapter 2, there's something there that's important. This is one of the deepest passages in all the Scripture. Will you put up Philippians chapter 2 for us, beginning in verse 5? Have this attitude or this thinking, this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although... Although he was equal, he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. It wasn't a, a pride issue for him, but instead he emptied himself. That is deep. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. There's a lot of Christology in that text. What does it mean that Jesus emptied himself? Does it mean that he gave up his divinity? No, because he would no longer be God. But maybe, just perhaps in our minds, what we could comprehend is that he took his divine attributes and he laid them in the hand of God. Now, I know that that's philosophical thinking, but just put that in your mind because this is what we know. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, something happened. All of a sudden, Jesus, the Son of God and God the Son, was confined to one location. God who is omnipresent, all places and at all times, God the Son, all of a sudden, is in one locale. How is that possible other than understanding that Jesus has emptied himself? His omniscience does it mean that he was no longer omniscient? No, but in the hands of the Father is where it laid, and that's why I would say, my Father has revealed to me. And so understanding that he is 100% God, but also 100% man is so important because I want to make sure you don't get this wrong because a lot of folks over history has done this, and I'm thankful that we are where we're at today. But here it is. Number one, he is not a man whom God rested upon. He is not a man, and God just came and rested upon him, and he used someone else's body. That's not it. He is not a man who God filled. He's not a man that was existing, and then God filled him, and that's how Jesus came about. He is not a body with two persons. He's not schizophrenic. He's not two persons independent of one another. He is the God-man who has two natures, but is one person that is inextricably woven together. That's the Jesus that we serve. That's a deeper understanding of who he is. And I'm telling you, people need to know that because the world has a little bit of a false understanding of who Jesus is. They know the baby Jesus, and they really like him. They like the Jesus who was meek and lowly and going and healing people and walking on water. That was amazing. But understanding the depth of who Christ is, that's something that's a little mind-boggling. And we need to make sure that they understand that. So, so theology, Christology, and then pneumatology, the Holy Spirit. Triune, he's coming in alongside us as the divine paraclete. In John 15, Jesus said, when the helper comes... Notice in the New American Standard that the H is capitalized. The H is capitalized because it's telling us this is a person. This is the Holy Spirit, not it, 
he. And the Holy Spirit is equal with God and, and co-eternal with God and the, the Father and the Son. John 16, verse 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will, helper will not come. But if he does, notice the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is going to come and he is going to convict the world of sin. He is going to, to convict the world for judgment. And he's going to reveal to them righteousness. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's the reality. You can't be saved without the Trinity. The Father initiated salvation. The Son paid for salvation. And the Holy Spirit convicts and draws us to salvation. That is necessary to understand the Trinity of God. Then he's omni. And I'm going to move very fast because you probably know these. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. And he is omnibenevolent. Those four things are what we use to describe who God is in his omnis. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and all-good. Number four, God is personal and eternal. Here's where I want to slow for just a second. We've really been deep talking about who God is, but I want to bring it back for a minute and say, and as deep as this is, God is personal and God is eternal. Deists believe that God may have created the universe, but then he's off doing his own thing, and he's not really concerned with us any longer. The Sadducees maybe would fall into this category, not believing that there's a resurrection or angels or that God's really all that concerned about us. But I'm telling you, God is. Uh, our brother saying before the preaching, his eye is on the sparrow. And I want to tell you that if God's eye would be upon the sparrow, be sure that his eye is on the crowning creation, humanity. So much so that Scripture says that he knows the very number of hair upon our head. He knows the days and the moments of our life. He knows everything about us. In so much, the Bible would say in that uh, legendary text that God so loved the world. And literally, listen to this, that he gave his only son. I want you to see this for a minute. In that text, do you see this word gave? It's the word didome, and it's the same understanding in the New Testament as in the Old Testament book of Isaiah 53. When Isaiah pens these words, he was esteemed stricken, smitten of God. By his stripes we were healed. That word smitten, to be struck, actually it means to be struck with the open palm, literally, that's the word gave. So when you read that text, for God so loved the world that he, he laid the open hand to his son. It was the father who had to inflict the wrath upon the son. That's how much he loves you and how much he loves me. Fifth and finally, two minutes. God is caring and compassionate. You know this text, Romans 5 eight. But God has demonstrated. He's not all talk. My mother taught me when I was growing up, if you ever, see if you can finish this. Actions speak louder than words. God is not all talk. He demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, here's the amazing thing that I think about that. The subject of God cannot be exhausted. Who he is. It can get deeper. We can always go deeper in Christ. But the amazing thing is, is that as deep as he is, as, as amazing as he is, the real word awesome is, should be assigned to God alone. When we understand that that's who God is, but that he wants a personal, intimate relationship with you and with me, and then listen, he has placed a specific call on your life. Not only did he look down through the corridors of time and he looked at you in your life and he said, look, I know who you are and I want you and I want you to be saved. He said, I want you to be called out. Man, called to the creek. Isn't that a great saying? And that's where you are. You're called. That's the God of the universe who is all of these things. He has a call on your life personally to be an ambassador and a representative in a new and an amazing way to where you get to break the bread of life and give it to other people. That, that ought to make you feel honored this morning. And so I challenge you, listen when you're in class. 
And uh, I know that there's going to be all kinds of things that you're introduced to that are brand new terms. And I'll be honest with you, some of it went over my head and I didn't get it at first. And sometimes, you know, I got some of it last week probably. You know, it t- takes some while to learn it and put it in your mind. But here's the reality. Just view it as, a, as an opportunity to get to know God better. Because this God who you want to get to know better, he knows absolutely everything about you. And that's how I want to close that. He knows right now if you have a need. He knows if you're heavy-hearted. He knows if you've got a struggle. He knows if you've got a crisis. He knows if you've got something to rejoice about. You've just gotten good news. I just want you to know that he knows that. In fact, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he says, your father knows what you have need of before you even ask. So someone has asked, well, why, why even pray then? If he knows what you're going to ask, why even pray? Because this, sometimes you need to know. And prayer sometimes is getting our heart bent to God's will rather than trying to get God's will bent to us. It's getting God's will done on earth rather than our will done in heaven. And so sometimes in voicing that, there is something healing for that that the Holy Spirit can use. And so I just want to pray for you before we close this morning. And uh, you, you get to uh, go to lunch and uh, just digest some of this as well. But I challenge you, go deeper raise the bar. People can handle it. I'm telling you, our kids at First Baptist knows the terminology of omnibenevolent. If a five-year-old can get omnibenevolence in their mind, your 40-year-olds and your college students that you're going to minister to, they can get hypostatic union. Don't, Don't patronize them that they can't get it. Go deeper and see the church get stronger, okay? Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we have the privilege to pray because your son has shed his blood and it's through the veil of his flesh that we approach you. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit will make intercession for us when we don't know what to say. But God, we know that as we desire to know you better, that you know everything about us. And God, as you know everything about us, Lord, examine us. Is there anything that is there that should not be? We want to be, as the psalmist said, that the meditations of our heart and the words of our mouth would be found pleasing in your sight, O Lord. So God, if there's sin that is there, unconfessed and unrepented of, convict us through your Holy Spirit. Let us repent and be made right with you and use us for your glory. And God, if there's struggle there, we know that you are the God of the impossible. Nothing is too hard for you. And so everything that's in the lives of these students God, we lay at your feet, trusting and knowing that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. We praise you today in Jesus' name, amen.